all people are when you manifestations obey God's word of that was built by slaves and I watched my daughters. There is nobody that respects women more than I do. There's a lot of crisis, a lot of bad. This. Hey everybody, a little special episode for you today. I'm actually going to share with you a chapter of my audiobook, which comes out on the 16th, just like a week from now. And this is one of the weirder chapters, but I kind of thought that it might be right on brand for the this podcast listener. <laughs> uh, it feels like some of the other material from this podcast. So I hope you enjoy it. If you enjoy it, please purchase the book anywhere that you would like, you know, the Kindle version, the physical version, or the audiobook, which will be released on audible.com. Should be released the same day as the physical book on April 16th, but uh, they don't allow indie people to have a specific date. So we, we tried to time it out so that it would be about that, uh, but it could be take a, give or take a day or two. Um, yes, I hope you enjoy this chapter of this book on this podcast. Isn't it fantastic? All of the circles. All right. Love you, everybody. One. Distinctions of important and unimportant are surely unknown to the Lord, lest for want of a pin the cosmos collapse. Paramahansa Yogananda I have good news for you, friend. The liberation that you seek from a life of suffering and meaninglessness can be found within the period at the end of this sentence. This may sound fantastic and absurd, and of course, it is. But that doesn't mean it's not true. That period, like every other jot and tittle of this universe, is nothing less than the fullness of an infinite, interconnected, non-dual mystery being the ineffable reality that is always and only this. And to directly experience this is freedom. That's a lot of fancy talk for a period. But do you have any idea what went into me typing out the complete first sentence of this chapter and ending it with that insignificant-looking little dot? Do you know how many people had to die for that particular mark to make it onto this page? Do you know how many pig orgasms occurred to get that tiny dot to appear in your conscious awareness? Do you know the eons of evolution and revolution that had to transpire including all the necessary cultural mimetic conditioning that may have made you uncomfortable with the phrase pig orgasms being included so early on in a book about spiritual realization. All this and immeasurably more took place in order for that easily overlooked speck to be perceived by your nervous system in tandem with all your previously stored memory of language and grammar and punctuation. That period, dear reader, was 13.77 billion years in the making. Countless wars were fought. Supernovas exploded. Asteroids collided. Planets cooled and whirled into orbit. Empires rose and crumbled. Suns gave rise to black holes that ended up swallowing up suns. Milk duds gave rise to soft-bellied guys who ended up swallowing more milk duds. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? Dearest listener, how can I explain this? Perhaps we could start by considering how that period was typed on a plastic key on a laptop computer. What amount of evolution and innovation did it take for that key to exist in this precise moment of space-time? How many philosophers, mathematicians, chemists, linguists, physicists, and factory workers were instrumental in the line of necessary work for this laptop computer to have a period key? 
try for a moment to take in just a fraction of the amount of artistic experimentation, electrical engineering, technological change, business development, and social engineering it took. How many court cases, laws, regulations, contracts, tax codes, dress codes, and fire codes did it take? And that's just for one single key, for one single dot that a 3rd century BCE librarian named Aristophanes thought might be helpful. How many other moments needed to happen for me to write this particular book with that particular period to this particular you? For instance, I wrote much of this chapter while riding in an airplane. But I'm writing this sentence on an elliptical machine at a gym. This one was written in a Chinese restaurant. This one was written in a combination of places, including riding on an escalator, standing in a perfume shop, sitting in a jury assembly room, and waiting in the surprisingly ornate marble lobby of a post office. This book was penned from and as a diverse set of happenings, a series of patterns and moments that were all tied together within the stories that I think of as my life and this book. The words were written early in the morning and late at night. It was written in bliss, in tears, in heartache, and in joyous wonder, and with some occasional duds here and there. But none of these events were cleanly isolated from any of the others. They all bled together in and as my life and this book. And what about you, dear reader? Unless you are the middle-aged Japanese businessman sitting next to me in 12B right now and sneakily glimpsing at my screen, you are reading this book in an entirely different context of space-time than the ones I'm writing these words within. But somehow the incalculable number of events leading to your reading this and my writing it have become strangely intertwined. Not only did you have to experience all the moments you have in order to pick up this book and read it, but I had to create an imaginary you in hopes that the real you would eventually come along and materialize my dream like an observer collapsing a probability wave into a particle. For you to be reading this right now, the me now writing it has to imagine some sort of you out there who can or could someday read and make sense of these letters and symbols. Who are you in my mind, dear reader? Maybe you're a listener of the Liturgist podcast or my band Gunger. Perhaps you are a janitor who pulled this book out of the trash at a Southern Baptist seminary. Maybe you are me, proofreading this chapter in a month or two, feeling a little self-conscious about all of the milk duds talk and taking stock of your physical fitness by gently poking your belly fat. To summarize this left of good writing techniques paragraph, regardless of who you really are, the infinite this, your current experienced now is being formed in part by the now of my admittedly inaccurate and illusory imagination of your currently experienced now. Trippy. It is only with my illusory imagination of both what sort of person you are and what I would like to say to you that I'm able to whittle down the vast interconnected mystery of my present experience into some sort of subjective, finite, manageable, and coherent narrative with which I can construct enough meaning to keep you turning these pages. For instance, do I want to tell you how just a minute ago a flight attendant interrupted my writing to ask me, Would you like warm nuts? Which my inner junior high school adolescent found humorous. How and why did I make the decision to write that? A few moments ago, I wasn't planning on writing it. If free will is a thing, I could have chosen to keep that bit of information to myself, but instead, I opted for full disclosure. I am doing this for at least two reasons that I can think of. First, I wanted to see if I could weave the moment into the imagined meaning-making matrix that I am using to write this book, which happens to depend a bit on chaos and absurdity. Like my grandma used to say, when life gives you lemonade, there's no need to fuck around with lemons. 
Footnote, she did not ever say this. But I thought my first F word in the book might be more tolerable for people if I blamed it on my grandmother, who was a lovely woman. May she rest in peace. Secondly, in my illusory imagination of you, you're the type of person who might chuckle or at least be willing to press on beyond the normal and understandable questions about this writer's sanity out of curiosity about where all this is headed. I admit, this book is off to a bizarre start. But please, friend, bear with me a bit longer before I really bring all of this home, because I want to bring aliens into it. Aliens, you ask? Yes, aliens with really powerful telescopes that can help you understand that the world you experience is completely subjective. Imagine that scientifically advanced aliens exist and are looking at the Earth through powerful telescopes right now. What do they see? The answer to that question depends entirely on how far away they are. So imagine that right now there is an alien named Marge in a star system a million light years away who's looking through her advanced alien telescope at Earth, watching you read this book. There's no need to be too creeped out at that idea, though. Because from your perspective, Marge will not see you reading this until a million years from now. That is how long it will take for the light reflecting off of you and this book to make it all the way to her telescope a million light years away. Now, let's say that you somehow happen to have gotten your hands on one of these really advanced alien telescopes as well. And let's say that you have also magically acquired the knowledge that Marge is currently watching you and know exactly where she is watching you from. Naturally, you're compelled to turn your own amazing telescope towards the sky and look back at peeping Marge's planet. What do you see? Well, even though Marge is currently looking at you from her home planet, what you see when looking back is not Marge, her telescope, or her current planet. What you see through your telescope is Marge's planet a million years ago. She can see you through her telescope. But as you look back, you can't see anything within a million years of her watching you. Weird, right? Okay. So now let's say that you get frustrated that you can't see Marge, even though you know she's there and looking at you, and decide to pan your telescope around the night sky a bit to see what else you can find. Luckily, you find another inhabited planet. And alas, you stumble across an alien named Jorge, Jorge. who just so happens to be looking right back at Earth through his own powerful telescope. One might expect to feel startled to look up into the sky and see an alien staring back at you, but not you, because you have already learned from your experience with Marge that the telescope views aren't going to be the same. Even though you can see Jorge staring right back at you with his telescope, you know he cannot see you. In fact, in a strange and convenient plot twist, Jorge just happens to be the right distance from Earth to be watching me writing this very chapter. So, to recap, Marge, who is a million light years away, is currently, from her perspective, watching you reading this book. You can't see her watching you from your perspective, but you can currently see Jorge, who is currently watching me write this book, which you will someday read in the future. Which means that if he's peeping at my screen like 12B over here, he knows you are watching him before you do. In this scenario, your reading of these words right now is not only happening in your present, but also in the future, as seen through Jorge's now, and the ancient past, as seen through Marge's now. How's your brain doing, dear reader? Here's my point. When you look deeply enough into any one moment, it becomes clear that there is no such thing as an objective or universal now. This is easier for us to see over long distances, like the ones in the above absurd scenario, but the truth and weirdness of special relativity applies even in face-to-face -face conversation. 
There is always some sort of lag of the now between you and every other observer you ever interact with who is inhabiting a different segment of space-time than you, which is everybody else. Your now is never my now. In fact, a single second of time up in this airplane that I'm riding in goes slightly faster than a single second of time down on the ground. Every moment we experience in this universe happens in a completely relative perspective. As physicist Carlo Rovelli put it, our intuitive idea of the present, the ensemble of all events happening now in the universe, is an effect of our blindness, our inability to recognize small temporal intervals. It is that blindness that gives us our sense of reality. It's like how a fire dancer's torch appears as a solid circle of flames as she spins it around her head. It's not actually a circle but our perception isn't fast enough to keep up with the precise space-time coordinates of the moving light. In short, the reality that you and I are experiencing as you read and I write is a lot weirder than it might seem. What you may have thought of as your simple now moment of reading this book is really some weird amalgamation or relationship of countless different moments that include dead grandmothers, luxury spas, the U.S. Postal Service, Japanese businessmen, and warm nuts. That period at the end of the first sentence of this chapter, and for that matter, everything in existence, is happening from and as a long, interconnected web of happenings, all of which are completely interdependent and inseparable from one another, like an unfathomably complex game of Sudoku. Every numbered box in this universe belongs exactly as it is within its context. To change one number would be to change them all. You, seeing the period in that first sentence, is tied to me riding in this airplane, which is tied to my grandfather missing a boat in Turkey and taking a different one, which led him to meeting my grandmother, which is tied to the weather patterns that the boat encountered on its way to America which is tied to the carbon emissions of the earth, which is tied to how many cows farted in the 18th century, which is tied to the size, timing, and precision of every asteroid that ever struck or missed the earth. John Don wrote that no man is an island. No moment is an island either. All of it goes together. A common metaphor used in describing the non-dual view is that of a wave in the ocean. In order to let that metaphor sink in, consider one more scenario. Imagine an ocean stretching out before you as far as you can see. The undulating surface of the water extends all the way to the horizon where it merges with the edge of the sky. Waves of turquoise blue crash onto the shore and crawl up to your toes with a slight sizzle of popping sea foam. Looking out at this endless precision of wave upon wave, you notice one particularly appealing ocean curl rising higher than the rest. This wave is especially intriguing, so you summon the magical powers you didn't know you had and scoop up the wave into a massive, clear glass container to bring back to your home with you. When you arrive, you set the wave container next to your front door, a bold, yet arguably misguided attempt at curb appeal. As you step back and look at it, you realize something is off. The wave doesn't look at all like it did in the ocean. Before you magically ladled it from the endless stretch of sea into your display case, it was a mighty turquoise cascade crowned with a foamy white crest curling down through its trough. Now that it's on your doorstep, it looks more like a large jar of dirty water. This is because waves aren't real and separate things from an ocean. Waves are the ocean waving. Waves are simply names we use to describe a type of pattern within the movement of the ocean. But there is no distance or separation between a wave and an ocean. Waves are oceans doing what oceans do, just as 
pears are what pear trees do, and human civilization is what the earth does. There is nothing in existence that is fundamentally separate from anything else. The full reality of one particular thing, say, a person, can never be found by simply adding up the separate constituency of its parts. Heart, lungs, brain, fingernails, etc. But it's in the relationship between all of those parts and all the other patterns of energy in its environment, which happens to be everything in the universe. Thinking of a person as separate from her surroundings that she exists within, the universe, is as arbitrary as thinking of a flower petal as a separate thing from a flower. The petal implies a stem, which implies soil, which implies sunlight, which implies gravity, and so on and so on. In the same way, a living brain implies a body which implies organic matter, which implies a planet a certain distance from a star, which also implies gravity, and so on. Human feet aren't planted into the ground, so most of us don't think about how fundamentally connected to the earth our bodies are, but our roots into the earth are the air we breathe, and the food we eat, and the water our bodies are made of. Human beings may be the wireless upgrade, but they are no less an extension and substance of the earth than a mountain is. You are literally the earth. You are the universe doing what the universe does. Just as light is what the sun does, or a wave is what the ocean does. You could also see this in the opposite way. The universe is you, capital Y, doing what you do. This is not how it feels to most of us because the nerve endings in our bodies end at our skin. This gives us the illusion of some sort of real boundary between the inside and outside of our bodies. But if you look closely enough, there is no such firm line. Our bodies are like a waterfall. Although the specific water molecules in a single waterfall are never the same from one moment to the next, there is a similar enough pattern in how the body of water moves due to our aforementioned blindness to small temporal intervals, for us to think of a waterfall as a consistent something. So we think of a waterfall as a noun, rather than a verb. This is exactly how it is with our bodies. The dance between the constantly changing cells, the quantum leaping electrons, the hundred trillion neutrinos passing through us at any given moment, the ever-moving kinetic energy of the quarks or binding energy of the gluons finds enough of a musical pattern in our particular speed of perception for us to name a something. But what you think of as you, or anything else for that matter, is simply movement within the ocean of being, of this. Rhythmic pattern within rhythmic pattern, music within music. There is literally no end to this string of events that is the universe. You've likely heard of the butterfly effect. Well, the truth of the matter is not just that the flutter of a butterfly's wings shapes weather patterns on Earth. The connection between events goes out much farther than that, to cosmological constants and electromagnetic fields and quantum gravity and everything and everyone that has ever been. The shape of your belly button? is interdependent with the specific color, density, and shape of a rock on the third moon orbiting planet Z345 in a distant solar system of the Andromeda galaxy. So yes, a lot went into the period at the end of that first sentence. Still, what does any of this have to do with that not okayness at the core of the human experience? What does seeing the interconnectedness of everything have to do with the amount of suffering or freedom that I experience? To get there, I'd like to tell you more of my story, and why what I experienced in that spa paved the way for an entirely new way of seeing and experiencing the world. I used to feel separate, alone, and afraid. The universe was a big scary place out there that I needed to be protected from. I was afraid of death. God was my answer to that fear, but he, too, was out there, 
an omnipotent being who technically loved me, but also watched me and judged my every thought, attitude, and action. At the end of the day, at the bottom of my stories, I was alone, hoping to be loved, to be saved, to be okay, but I wasn't okay. For years, I suffered in the darkness of shame, doubt, and repression. I was a prisoner to my circumstances and the stories I experienced them through. I am not a prisoner anymore. I hope that by the end of this book, you will see that you don't have to be either. <laughs>